Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Wild Eye Journalist Talk, Investigating Wildlife Crime in, in Asia. Uh, my name is Amy Sim from the Internews Earth Journalism Network, Asia Pacific. This webinar is jointly organized by Internews Earth Journalism Network and the Ox Packers Center for Investigative Environmental Journalism. And it's one of our events to mark the World Environmental Day on June 5th. The Wild Eye Project was launched by the Ox Packers in 2019, first in Europe, um, with the support of the Earth Journalism Network. It is a digital tool that collects and shares data on wildlife seizures, arrests, court cases, and convictions, and serves as a good resource for researchers and journalists to tell their stories about wildlife crime. Um, last year, uh, around May 2020, with uh, more attention focused on the wildlife trade as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, this wildlife tool has been expanded to cover Asia as well. Um, after a year and a half, Wildlife Asia has conducted many in-depth um, investigations using a range of data sources to help us uh, better understand wildlife trade in Asia. And today we're very glad to have some of these journalists who have worked on these stories to come and share their experiences and lessons. There are two parts uh, to today's program. Um, the, in the first session, we will uh, learn uh, from the journalists um, some of the experiences, challenges um, and, and successes um, while doing the stories uh, together with the Wild Eye Project. In the second session, we'll look at what data journalists and investigative journalists have in common. We will take questions at the end of each session, but you're welcome to drop your questions uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any point of this webinar, and we'll try to address them during the Q&A session. And so without further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, Roxanne Joseph. She is a uh, Wild Eye Project Manager to tell us a bit more about the Wild Eye Project in Asia its achievements and some of the lessons learned over the past year and a half. Over to you, Roxanne. Thank you, Amy. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever in the wherever in the world you're based. Thank you so much for joining us as we begin the process of wrapping up this portion of the Wild Eye Asia project. I assure you that there's plenty more to come. So please do keep an eye on the platform and on our social media, um, on Oxpeckers and on EJN. My name is Roxanne and I work with Oxpeckers on the Wild Eye project. Um, mapping and tracking illegal wildlife trade. And I've been lucky enough to work with these incredibly talented investigative and data journalists over the past year and a half. Um, and I really look forward to seeing them share the challenges that they faced, how they overcame those um, and the lessons they learned. But before we get to their presentations, just for a bit of context, I'm going to speak a bit more about um, what we actually learned from the Wild Eye Project. So without further ado. Um, so what is Wild Eye? Wild Eye is an open source tool that maps seizures, arrests, court cases and convictions of illegal wildlife trafficking. We currently have two versions of the tool, one based in Europe and the other based in Asia, which is what we're speaking about today. And in the coming months, we'll be launching another one. WildEye was developed by jointly by Oxpeckers and EJN, and it was developed by journalists for journalists, but this doesn't mean that it is exclusively for journalists. We encourage everyone who's interested in the issue to use the platform. What we did was we created our own data sets, collecting data from multiple sources, and we continue to do this. Um, this is an ongoing and very lengthy process. And we made these incidents accessible, freely and openly accessible. Um, Wild Eye allows personalized access to data. 
just meaning that you can access and view information that you're interested in, whether it be a particular case or um, trafficking in a particular species or a particular region on the continent. Wild eye can be used among many things for analysis, research, and of course, what we'll hear about today, storytelling. And until now, there's been no single place to access information easily on the crackdown, global crackdown on wildlife crime. So Wild Eye addresses this gap by sharing data on justice in action. And if that doesn't interest or impress you, then I'll let the numbers do the talking. So since launching Wild Eye Asia in May last year, which was quite early on into the pandemic, as Amy mentioned, we've published a total of 14 data-driven investigations in eight different countries in various languages and on multiple um, local media outlets. We've engaged with well over 600 people, many of them journalists, but also law enforcement agencies, government, conservationists, academics, the list goes on and on through workshops like this um, and webinars. And we've also published just about 2000 individual data points um, on the Wild Eye Asia map. So as I've said, these are seizures, arrests, court cases, and of course, successful convictions. As Amy mentioned, this program is gonna be separated into two parts, which really speaks to what Wild Eye Asia is about. It's about the investigations on one hand, and also how these investigations use the data. These are just some of our journalists. And I, I must say that not all of the journalists um, that we supported and worked with are uh, able to join us today. These are just a handful of them, um, but I have no doubt that you'll be impressed by what they have to share. I won't talk about the investigations. Uh, I'll leave that up to them, but I encourage you to go to Oxpeckers, search under tools where you'll find Wild Eye Asia, and you can read all of these incredibly impressive investigations for yourself. And then of course, we have the other aspect of Wild Eye, as I mentioned, which is the data. Um, and we will be joined by two of our more data uh, focused grantees today. And they'll, they'll speak a bit more about that. Um, and while we're speaking about data, uh, I think it's important to give you a bit more of an understanding of what we've found over the past year and a half. So, Unsurprisingly, the majority of incidents mapped were based in Vietnam. Um, this is actually a little bit more than 40% at the moment. Other countries with high incidents included China and Hong Kong, for example. Over one and a half thousand different items were seized. These are animal parts, uh, their products and derivatives including, for example, ivory with over 130 incidents, live pangolins with over 90 incidents, rhino horns with over 80 incidents, and pangolin scales with well over 60 incidents. And of course, the average sentence handed down to criminals was five years imprisonment, followed by one year, um, as well as uh, 10 years. These are just some examples of the punishment handed down in courts across the continent. We've been lucky enough to partner and collaborate with dozens of organizations around the world. Um, these six are simply our data sources. Um, so some of them uh, we continuously look to for information that they make publicly available and others are contrib contributors. So they're more proactive partners who share data with us. And often these result in investigations such as our, one of our more recent ones uh, based in Hong Kong where the ADM Capital Foundation provided us with nearly 300 incidents um, of court cases based in the country. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole list to you, but Wild Eye has engaged, partnered, and collaborated with more than 50 organizations. These include law enforcement agencies, many local media outlets, government, um, and NGOs, and the list goes on and on and on. A few takeaways from the Wild Eye Asia project. So these are the more 
kind of negative ones. Um, and unfortunately, wildlife trafficking has continued to thrive despite the pandemic. I think initially, a lot of people thought that it would slow it down, uh, making because it's, it's more difficult to transport products from country to country. Um, but criminals have just found other ways to get around this. Um, some, but not all countries' laws and legislations are adapting to the situation. So this is both a positive and a negative, but there is a lot of work still to be done. Um, and then of course the kingpins, um, the fat cats, the big guys are seemingly always one step ahead. It's obviously very difficult to catch these people and the majority of incidents mapped on Wild Eye Asia are seizures, arrests, and cases where the mules, um, the people transporting or kind of doing the dirty work are caught and convicted. Um, then some more positive takeaways. Luckily, uh, because of uh, more attention being shined on wildlife trafficking um, and it's linked to zoonotic diseases, um, more resources, sorry, due, due to the pandemic, more resources and support is becoming available to law enforcement. And we've seen a concerted effort to crack down on wildlife crime because the world's eyes really are on um, source and hub um, and endpoint countries. And then of course, there is a growing interest in data journalism, which we'll hear more about later on in the program, but we're very happy to see this. Um, Data really is difficult to access in some places, but what we found is that working with local journalists and local media outlets really has been a great way uh, to get access and to be able to publish this information. And then of course, probably the biggest takeaway is that we've, an achievement is that we've liberated a significant amount of data, which is now able to and is currently being used by journalists and law enforcement to crack down on wildlife crime. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand back over to Amy and I look forward to your questions and the discussions that will follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roxanne. That's a lot of work in the past year and a half. Uh, next up, we have Jasette Oinano. Um, Jasette is an investigative reporter at the Philippine Daily Inquirer, and she's also a UN Climate Change Conference COP24 fellow. Her investigation for Wildlife Asia looked into court case data from 2013 to 2020 and showed how wildlife criminals um, have got away easily um, while the government is, is, is battling to improve and increase penalties. Uh, Jasette, over to you. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, allow me to share my presentation. Um, I hope everyone's seeing my screen. Uh, thank you so much, Amy and Roxanne, for that intro. Um, once again, my name is Josette Enano. I am a reporter for the Philippine Daily Inquirer. So for our folks here who are not from the Philippines, the Philippine Daily Inquirer is one of the widely, most widely circulated newspapers in the Philippines. And I am currently the environment reporter where for the past few years, I had the opportunity to really zero in and focus on um, a lot of environmental issues here in the Philippines, uh, particularly in biodiversity, climate change, and uh, natural hazards and disasters. And so allow me to, to kind of walk you through some of my um, uh, challenges that I faced in, in my investigation for Wild Eye Asia, as well as some of the lessons and takeaway that I've learned throughout this entire process. And so just very briefly, I know Amy kind of touched into this, the story that I did for Wild Eye Asia project really focuses on wildlife crime cases and convictions. So I, de I decided to look at the past uh, data for the past seven years from 2013 to 2020, to really map how you know, the Philippine government is winning its fight um, against wildlife crime. As you know, the Philippines is one of the biodiversity hotspots, but it is also very rich in biodiversity. And so enforcement um, operations have been going up in the past several years, but 
what I've found out looking at the data is that even though we have improved our surveillance operations, our enforcement operations, the weak link in this chain really is in terms of prosecution. Uh, a lot of the wildlife criminals are still uh, going away with just a slap on their wrist with slow penalties and um, some of them even um, get away um, from or escaping jail time. And so I'd like to highlight, um, I'd like to highlight a quote that was shared to me in the story that I did. So this story was published um, in the Philippine Daily Inquirer. I don't know if you can see my screen, but it's published in the front page of the Philippine Daily Inquirer this June 1st, which is perfect because it's the June is the Philippine Environment Month. And of course, it was also um, published in the Oxpecker's website. And I invite you all to head over there and read the full investigation. And again, I just want to highlight this really um, strong or powerful quote I, I received from my interview from the executive director of the Palawan Council for Sustainable Development. He said that with the environmental damage that wildlife criminals do, it is an intergenerational crime. And I, I guess this quote just really you know, highlights how important it is that we continue to shed light on the different issues that hound um, our biodiversity and continue to mainstream these kinds of challenges that not only um, our wildlife law enforcers face, but also the different conservationists and stakeholders that really work hard to, to you know, put a stop to, to wildlife crime, um, not just in Asia, but all over the world. And so these are some of the challenges that I faced in, in, my, um, in the course of my reporting. So number one, as mentioned also by Roxanne in her PowerPoint presentation earlier, access to data is really a challenge. Um, I highlight three points, which um, I found some roadblocks in, in my reporting for this particular story. Number one, there is an absence of a centralized database for wildlife crime. And the absence of a centralized database would also lead to some gaps and inconsistencies in data and information. This would mean that um, in the course of my reporting, I had to approach different agencies and really go through different kinds of documents to be able to get the data that they need for the story. And then at the same time, there is also the absence of a single agency that is tasked to oversee all wildlife or environmental crime in the Philippines. You know, these challenges are not just the very challenges that journalists in the Philippines face in our reporting, but I'd also like to think that these are some of the obstacles that the government must hurdle in order to properly see if, you know, they are actually, um, you know, getting some successes in, in in their battle against wildlife crime. I say that because um, in my interviews, I found out that even the government, um, or the law enforcers themselves are having a hard time tracking if they are actually able to really convict um, some of the arrests, you know, arrested criminals that they were able to, to you know, put behind bars in, in the past couple of years. They themselves admit that it is a challenge to really follow through these cases and make sure that you know, these same offenders do not repeat the same crimes over and over again. So aside from the challenges in the accessing of data, of course, there's also the challenge in accessing sources in case studies. There are two main roadblocks in, in that note. Number one is the lockdowns, of course, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the other one, which existed even before the pandemic happened, is geographical limitations. So most of the case studies uh, that I, uh, I highlighted in the story are thousands of kilometers from where I am. And because of the lockdowns, I can't fly or I can't travel um, to really visit, for example, the, the regional uh, environment offices or the, the local or provincial um, probation or even the local courts. Um, and so there's really that challenge of accessing the sources, you know, the, the sources of information and even the paper trail that I needed for the story. And so I'm just, um, I'm just, really uh, thankful that I was able to build um, relationship with the sources, you know, the government officials and, and the other stakeholders, you know, wildlife experts that I have spoken to in the past several years of doing wildlife reporting, that they were able to link me to the right people and basically help me and uh, lead me towards the sources of information that are valuable for my story.
And another challenge that I'd also like to highlight, and I'm not sure if this is just in the Philippines, but perhaps it's something that you know other journalists here can, can possibly relate to, is answering the reader's question of, so what? You know, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of, you know, the reporting has really shifted into focusing into the virus, you know, the recession, the economic challenges that we are facing because of the pandemic. But I think that, you know, these collaborations with, for instance, uh, the Oxpecker Center and the Internews Earth Journalism Network really just highlights how important it is to continue reporting on environment and wildlife issues, to continue mainstreaming these kinds of issues, because even if you know environment stories kind of took a back seat in 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 this time um, it is important to make people remember that you know this virus that we are facing at the moment it's rooted in how we as human beings interact with our natural environment so moving forward what are some of the lessons that i learned um, in the course of my reporting so Number one is there's really a need for consistent coverage and reportage on wildlife crime. Um, in my case, I have been reporting on wildlife issues uh, since 2019. And in 2019, I was able to also publish a three-part story on wildlife trafficking and illegal trade in the Philippines, really zeroing in on how you know, it affects um, you know, our, the, the economy and how um, wildlife criminals are shifting to online means. And, and this was really valuable for me in, in the course of my reporting now in different circumstances because of the pandemic, because I was able, during that time, I was also able to gather data, although it's a bit more limited compared to the seven year um, data that I had uh, for this story that I did for Oxpeckers. Um, but um, through the data set that I was able to, to gather during that time, as well as the consistent monitoring of wildlife crime over the past few years, I was also able to build uh, my own um, database somewhat of, of the different um, wildlife crime and enforcement operations that was happening in my country. And this was very crucial in cross-checking and verifying the data. I found myself filling in some of the blanks and the gaps that I saw in some of the information that I gathered from the government agencies for this particular reporting. And so it was very helpful that I was able to um, have these kinds of information um, with me already and further build on it um, as we go along. And I think this is also why, um, for example, the work of Wild Eye Asia is very important because you know you have already these access accessible data sets that as Roxanne mentioned, is not only valuable for journalists, but also I think for government officials and wildlife law enforcers um, across not just the region, but the world. And again, I also like to emphasize the importance of collaboration. So when I did my 2019 story, I, I'd like to say that I was a, a one woman team. Um, I did that story, um, well, of course, with the support of my editors at the Philippine Daily Inquirer, but um, really this time working with, with, um, with the Oxpecker Center, with Earth Journalism Network, it really gave um, a bit more um, grounding in my reporting in the sense that I was able to get mentorship and guidance and you know, just really um, strengthening and making sure that the reporting is more solid um, as it should be. And another lesson that I'd also like to highlight, you know, given the challenges that I spoke about earlier, is the need for extra resourcefulness and determination. You know, as journalists, we are known for being a very dogged in our reporting, but because of the challenges that are presented to us by the pandemic, you know, not just the lockdowns and the travel restrictions, but basically the need to protect ourselves from, from this virus or from getting sick. So there's really a need, you know, for, for extra a little bit more of resourcefulness, a little bit more of determination. And, and this was really um, something that I applied in my reporting for this story because um, I, I found myself uh, really you know, sending that extra email, making that extra call. And it really bore fruit because I was able to, to gather the information and the data that I needed for the story and even went beyond what I thought was going to be my minimum story. Um, for this report. Um, I found myself just, just a bit of a backstory. I was trying to reach out one of the offices in, in um, Tagaytay City. So that's, that's a few hundred kilometers from me where I reside in, 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 in Manila. And because you know, the, government, the government agency's website 
was not updated to really reflect the, the contact numbers, I found myself calling up several private residences for my story. Uh, I think I called uh, about three to five um, private individuals because I really couldn't get in touch with the agency that I needed. Uh, luckily, I was able to send them an email and after a week or so, um, they were able to get back to me and we were able to, you know, really just touch base and discuss um, the information that I needed for the story. And onto that, um, I'd also think that it's very important to keep close communication and and I'd like to emphasize this, building trust with our sources. You know, as journalists, our sources are essentially our lifeline to a lot of the stories that we do. And I'm very thankful that, as I mentioned, I have been doing wildlife crime stories for the past several years, that I was able to really um, establish um, this close communication with my sources that they would be able to alert me, for instance, if there are enforcement operations that you know, I could be writing on or just really just um, adding into the database or this bank of information that I have on, on wildlife crime in, in the Philippines. And it's very important to, especially in the time of the pandemic, to keep close communication with, with these experts, you know, with, with wildlife law enforcers, especially if it's really a challenge to travel to, to certain locations for your reporting. So what are some of the ways forward? So just, you know, just very briefly, I think that it is very important to have um, continuous resources and newsroom support to be able to do these kinds of stories. You know, when they talk about um, environment stories, uh, even wildlife crime in particular, it, it's not probably something as, uh, as, if I may use the word, it's probably not something as sexy or as enticing as let's say political reporting or, or even show business, right? But it is really important that we keep a close eye on, on these kinds of, of stories and issues because you know these are stories of our survival essentially when we talk about you know biodiversity and, and wildlife. And so it is important that you know journalists are given the resources, may it be time, um, uh, financial backing, and of course guidance and mentorship from the newsrooms and from organizations, for example, such as the Internews Earth Journalism Network, for us to be able to continue um, this kind of very um, important um, storytelling. And of course, there's also the importance of continuous training on data journalism and environment reporting. So I'm, I'm pretty young. I have been doing environment reporting for just several years now, but um, every day I continue to learn um, on how to, to further be better in my reportage. And I think that you know opportunities to, to be able to connect and network with other journalists and, and conservationists are very vital in our reporting because it further enriches um, our stories as, as we move forward, hopefully to, to a better normal after um, this pandemic. So that's it from my end. I'm, I'm leaving on my screen my contacts. Um, please get in touch with me through email or on Twitter. Um, and I'd really, really love to hear your questions and to also hear from the other panelists uh, that we have uh, this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jacette. Um, congratulations on this very uh, important story. Um, I take away from your presentation the importance of, you know, being consistent and, you know, doing consistent uh, reporting and coverage on the wildlife uh, crime, um, as well as, you know, to build a relationship with sources uh, over a long period of time. And this is especially important during uh, COVID lockdown period when you can't uh, go out and do stories. Uh, so you have to depend on these relationships that you have built uh, over the years. Um, and also your point about collaboration, the importance of working with um, other organizations out there like the Oxpackers who have been collecting the data and, and many other sources. And, and finally, the, um, you know, determination and, and grit, I guess, um, of, of journalists to pursue this topic, this really important topic, um, even when uh, there's a lot of attention going to COVID-19, um, you know, it's, it's important to, to, to remind uh, ourselves and, and our readers that, uh, you know, COVID-19 has its root causes um, in the environment, and, and it's especially closely linked to wildlife trade. Um, moving on, uh, we have uh, our freelance journalists uh, from Vietnam, Vo Q Bao Yuan, um, who interestingly also uh, found that the criminals um, are also getting quite light court sentences, um, even though uh, the authorities in Vietnam has been 
um, increasing penalties for these crimes and really having a, 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 a crackdown on wildlife trafficking. Um, Bao Yuan will share with us how she uses different data sources to develop to develop the story. Over to you, Bao Yuan. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Bao Yuan, and I'm a freelance journalist in Vietnam. And um, yeah, uh, today I uh, will I, I'm, I'm going to share my cha my challenges and um, my lesson I get from uh, the project. Uh, hold on. I want to share my uh, presentation. Oh, no. Sorry. Sorry, I, I cannot share my presentation now on share screen. It's okay. We um we can try okay. to uh, put up your presentation. Just give yes. us a couple okay. of no problem. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, my um the, the first I at first I admit that uh, I'm I'm I, I was not too confident in this project because um in Vietnam the database is uh, not useful uh, for data journalists and um so uh, because um hold on. Sorry, hold on, give, give me a few minutes. Sure, we have your, your presentation oh. up actually. It's, it's on yes. the screen. Yes, hold on. Okay, sorry. Um, and um, so uh, first uh, I have, um, I'm not. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm going to share. I'm going to share my challenges. My challenges are uh, when I were conducting the project, and uh, at first, uh, at first, I admit that I was not uh, con too confident uh, with with the project because uh, government database was unhelpful for data journalists. Um, the data uh, in Vietnam. Especially uh, information the arrest on uh, the record of trials were not um, updated uh, and or delayed updated or sometimes even not updated and uh, they are they were so messy and difficult to to file uh, the function just um, do not really work. And um, information were not shared publicly. Uh, Vietnamese government uh, was not open to foreign media. So, uh, before, uh, so how we did it, how we tackled it. Uh, I sought and collected data from multiple sources. And uh, for, for example, Education for Nature of Vietnam, INV, the uh, local media, the Supreme People's Call of Vietnam. And uh, I figured out that uh, in many cases, in many records um, of trials, half of information about them was published on the local media first, and the other half was later updated on the Supreme People's Call of Vietnam or Library of Law or Education for Nature of Vietnam. And um, the records of the first instance and the uh, a, a, a balance of the same case uh, were not put together and they, are, they were separated. And sometimes uh, we could only get the, re the records of either one of them. Uh, so uh, after searching and collecting, uh, I, I would uh, put information together. And, and then uh, I uh, classified the data, first instance and a ballot, uh, and uh, not the serial cases. Uh, and and, that, and uh, I moved on uh, onto the next step. Uh, after searching, collecting the data, uh, I would uh, and I would uh, 
analyze the data. Uh, and uh, um, through the project, uh, I, re I, re I, re I reconfirm that numbers alone do not tell a story. But if we put numbers uh, together side by side, we could see a great story. Uh, we compared case before and after new Vietnamese criminal criminal lawyer came into effect in uh, 2018. And um, uh, we compared how many cases were tried before and after the new law, uh, what were the average prison sentence and how many and how much were criminals fined. And uh, we take it up the serious, the fifth crisis um, because uh, all of Vietnamese uh, official denied my interviews. So uh, I had to read the official wildlife case papers in the core magazine. The core magazine is uh, published is uh, probably in the Vietnam court system. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, the day as, uh, after all, after searching, collecting and uh, analyzing, uh, we, uh, we got the, the result that although the law was harsh on paper, but uh, in reality, punishments, punishments were too uh, lenient for the level of criminal activity. Uh, besides the besides the cha cha besides the changes, um, I'm uh, I got something that I learned from the um, project. Um, I um, that's a how to visualize the data uh, to 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 um, e uh, to be easy for the audience to understand uh, how to visualize the data in a way uh, attractive. Uh, Get the uh, um a, a, a catching and we chose char we 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 chose um classify the data on area and then uh, we uh, pin uh data on the Vietnam uh, on the map of Vietnam and uh, uh when uh, and uh, look at the map of Vietnam the audience uh, can now clearly that clearly where where are the wildlife criminal hotspot in Vietnam. And uh, the data uh, after, uh, uh, after, um, um, uh, after present, after, after visualizing and, um, uh, and analyzing the data, uh, the data, the, um, the other result uh, we got that, uh, so are the laws enough uh, in Vietnam for wildlife crime? Um, grammar. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, I interviewed some legal expert and uh, legal expert uh, gave uh, some advice for Vietnamese government, uh, like um, uh, use of relevant laws uh, and regulations uh, and focus on and arrest high courts and king bin and uh, Im Im implementation is now needed. Yeah, and uh, eradicate corruption. Um, and uh, I want to uh, I want to say um, many thanks to Rosen and uh, Fiona. Uh, the Rosen and Fiona helped me to uh, classify data and pin them on map to uh, to visualize data in the way uh, I catching. Yeah, and uh, yeah, here here are uh, my challenges and my lesson I got the from the from um, project. So sorry uh, for uh, my inconvenience. I don't share my uh, presentation on screen. On screen. Yeah. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Bao Yuan. Um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting to hear from you about how even in, in an environment like Vietnam, where data is not always open. Um, you can still, um, you know, uh, look, find uh, ideas for, for stories through looking at different sources of data and putting different data and information together um, and, and, and try to work out um, some of the, the information that you're, you're getting out of there. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we will now uh, open to, to your questions. Um, let me have a quick look at the Q&A. Um, yeah, so please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A 
uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and before we get to answer these questions, I thought we can um, have a quick chat with uh, investigative journalist Sadiq Nabhi from India. Um, he did this very interesting story um, in collaboration with Walleye Asia, looking at how the insurgents um, in northeast India um, have actually been facilitating the uh, the syndication of, of, of rhino poaching, of, of uh, exporting rhino horns uh, from India to China via Myanmar. Um, Sadiq, are you there? Be... Hi, hi, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi, me? Sadiq. Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm interested to know, since your article was published back in August, I think last year, um, have you seen any follow-up, you know, in, in terms of law enforcement or any responses you have observed? So one, uh, one uh, follow-up action that has happened, which I see which is very clear, is that that particular organization I wrote about in my article, that has come into focus for its role uh, and uh, all its alleged involvement in cases of rhino poaching. So that is one good thing which has happened. Also, uh, there is, uh, I hope I'm audible properly. Yes, you are. Can you speak a slightly louder, actually? Yeah, is it fine now? Yeah, good. Yeah, another, 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 another uh, possibility. I mean, which has not happened so far, but which is likely to happen uh, in the near future, is this particular case uh, going to the anti-terror agency of the of the country, which is the National Investigation Agency, because uh, because of uh, involvement of a uh, armed outfit in, in in the case, you know in such cases. So these are, uh, these are uh, two things uh, which have happened. And uh, otherwise, otherwise there is, uh, Assam, uh, as I told, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the last uh, uh, webinar as well, that there, there is, there is a very, very, uh, the, the, the state is very sensitive to cases of rhino poaching, especially because rhino is supposed to be, you know, it's it, it, uh, a very important part of the culture and, you know, of the Assamese conscience as such. Uh, so there is, uh, there is a, already a lot of uh, kind of, you know, effort to make sure that uh, all these uh, poachers are not successful, but there have been sporadic uh, cases of poaching. I mean, there has not been any increase as such uh, due to the pandemic, but, uh, but um, there have been like, I think three cases since March 2020, that's when the pandemic started, particularly of rhino poaching. At the same time, uh, there have been many instances of uh, high profile uh, poachers, wildlife traffickers being arrested. There was one case uh, which I wrote about in my story. Then there was another guy who was arrested, uh, who the uh, wildlife uh, protection guys were after for many years. He was finally caught. A few months back, then there have been some uh, recent arrests in uh, adjoining uh, Kaziranga National Park, which is where you have the most number of rhinos. There were three people who were arrested with uh, with very sophisticated uh, rifles recently, which 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 meant that uh, you know they are they are still at it, looking for a window of opportunity. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sadiq. Uh, it's interesting to hear about these new developments. Um, yeah, and, and as you mentioned, like, you know, wildlife trafficking um, is often very closely linked with other crimes like, um, you know, uh, illegal arm trade, for example, in this instance. Um, so it's important, you know, as, as I think just mentioned about this collaboration, we, we, we don't just look at um, wildlife crime in, in isolation, that we have to collaborate with different, you know, agencies, relevant agencies and uh, other civil societies who are monitoring, monitoring data um, of wildlife trade, of, of illegal uh, arms trafficking and, you know, even even other other crimes. Right, right. Um, I, I wanted I to... I wanted to point, I mean, I, I had a suggestion that, you know, what is happening, these, I mean, mostly is that, uh, you know, 
I mean, it's happening with investigation agencies as well that they catch the carriers, but they are uh, not able to unravel the whole chain because it's, uh, it expands various countries, you know. So that is where they hit the roadblock. So they might lead to, uh, they might be able to catch uh, maybe if there are four parts, so they might be able to catch two, but they are not able to get to the other two. So the That's same true. way, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's important for journalists to also collaborate, you know. Uh, for example, like I could not uh, go beyond what was happening in Myanmar or what was happening in, uh, you know, in the destination country. So for a wholesome uh, investigation, it is, I think it is uh, important that we start collaborating with our colleagues in other countries, you know, which would, which would, uh, which, which could be useful. Yeah, very true indeed. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it is a, a transboundary uh, story um, and we need to approach it in, in such a way. I think some of the government agencies, they're limited by their mandate to look within the boundary. But I think even for, for, for a lot of these agencies, they're beginning to work together with similar agencies across the border. Um, so, you know, for journalists, it's, it's, it's more important for, for us um, to work with our peers in neighboring countries to try and really um, get a better understanding of, of how um, wildlife traits uh, operate. Um, there are some questions here which I'd like to uh, put forward to our panelists and, and also Sadiq, uh, feel free to answer. Um, I think uh, Lin Gwen um, asked a couple of questions on, um, on, on how do we address this challenge of uh, access to data and how can we lobby the government, I guess, lo lobby governments and NGOs um, you know, so that uh, we can have uh, both journalists and the public with better access uh, to, to data. And there's another question about whether, you know, any of you have had any luck when you directly speak to policy makers um, to get access to some of this data that may not be publicly available. Um, feel, you know, uh, any of the panelists, you're, you're free to address um, this, this question. Josette, do you want to go first? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll take the first crack. Um, well, on accessing data, I think for the Philippines at least, the biggest challenge was there's really a lack of a centralized database um, for data. So what I did was I got in touch with several government agencies to really try to build this, you know, this big database. But essentially what I've also found out is that um, most of the information at least that I needed for my story was already with the Environment Department's central agency. The problem is that they collate the different reports from at least 16 regional offices across the Philippines. And that's really a challenge because you have to, you know, you have to egg on, you know, these different local offices to really, you know, consistently submit reports to them. And that's the challenge that one of the, you know, that this um, agency is facing at the moment. So the question is also how could the government and NGOs help with this? Well, I think that it would be helpful if there would be, at least for the case of the Philippines, really a centralized database for all environmental crime. In that way, we would be able to gauge or assess if we are actually, you know, succeeding in our fight against uh, what environmental criminals. But at the same time, it is also important to involve other stakeholders, such as um, local and even international organizations. For instance, I know traffic has been very, um, very focused on a lot of wildlife crime investigations in Asia. So it is also good to also reach out to, to, to them and to other organizations who may be doing their own databases um, as well. So I think it's just important to really just put all of our heads together. And so we have this one centralized database that we could all refer to and really see um, the successes that we have moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Bao Yuan, do you have anything yes. to add? Uh, yes, uh, I want to uh, give uh, an answer, answer for Lin Nguyen and Nguyen, and Nguyen Nguyen's question. Uh, yeah, uh, first, um, uh, Lin Nguyen, uh, yeah, uh, as you know, Lin Nguyen, uh, in Vietnam, we already uh, have a new, have a, the law of information access, but there are many problems uh, in the real, uh, real in, in, in implementation. Um, the process is very time consuming. And uh, so I look for the, um, the support from NGO, that name, and 
uh, uh, RBN, uh, environmental um, NGO uh, for protecting animal wildlife. And at um, the same time, I, uh, I accept to the website of uh, Supreme uh, Court of Vietnam. Um, and um, I also look for the for secondary data from the news and call ma ma the call magazine. Uh, and next, um, the ans the the question Wing Wing um, Wing Wing asked me, do you have a try to make interview with policy maker or law enforcement to accept the data? Uh, unfortunately, um, policy maker is Vietnam is is difficult to contact and even they are asked, uh, they will deny to answer. I did, I did uh, many times email to a government, to official, but uh, I, so far I haven't uh, received any reply uh, from them. And um, yeah. <laughs> So um, anyway, I, I, want to, I want to say that it's it difficult to access the data in Vietnam because uh, the law of access in information in data don't, do, do not really, really work. And uh, Vietnamese government um, often want to hide, the, hide in many, a lot of information and um, government uh, are often not open to uh, Foreign media and even local media. Yes, thank so, you. For thank you. Um, so there's a follow-up question on also like even NGOs. Um, I think Gerald from Cambodia say um, you know in, in in often we we see that uh, NGOs also they they are quiet. You know even though they might have some data or they don't want to jeopardize their relationship with the local government. With, with, you know they don't want to take the risk to jeopardize their MOU with the government. Um, do you have any experience uh, similar to that and how do you try to overcome uh, this challenge? Um. As I uh, as, as, as I said in my pres my presentation, uh, I um, I accept the data and collect data from uh, many sources. Uh, for example, RBN, uh, that's the NGO for protecting animal wildlife, and uh, I uh, I search the data on local media and uh, the website of uh, Supreme School. And uh, in many cases, half of uh, information about uh, the cases was published uh, on the local media first, and then the other half was later updated on the Supreme Court. And uh, I, I searched and collected and I put them together. <laughs> and uh, uh, sometimes uh, I could only get the request of either one of them. I, I can, um, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so there's a fair bit of uh, your own kind of uh, forensic um, work going on there. Um, anything to add from Sadiq or Jasset? There are lots of interesting questions, so I'm, I'm going to maybe move on to other questions. Um, and then, um, yeah, so there's a question on, uh, maybe not so much a question, but a comment, like, you know, I think so far, um, just said, and Bao Yuan, you talk about uh, court cases and looking at convictions, but beyond law enforcement, there's a lot of illegal trade out there that's not been caught, uh, not been um, found. And uh, how how can journalists go about, uh, you know, looking at these cases and try to discover them? Sadiq, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I think Sadiq having a bit of connection issue, is that right? Just that, do you have any, any experience trying to look into wildlife crimes? I mean, you know, uh, illegal wildlife uh, activities that are not really um, picked up by the law enforcement authorities? Sure. Um... You know, that's really a challenge. Um, I think I would approach the question from also the situation of the Philippines where, you know, geographical issues are also a concern. 
um, this is not just a challenge for journalists, but also for law enforcers. You can't possibly police all 7,100 plus islands to make sure that, you know, a lot of the entry points in the Philippines are not being used as transshipment points for, for example, poached animals from Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. And that's what hap what's happening really at the moment. And so just speaking from experience, I haven't really had that opportunity to really dig deep into these um, possible um crime that, that has been happening um, undetected. But definitely, uh, NGO partners and, and what conservationist groups have been saying, and even you know, wildlife law enforcers are already saying that there are a lot of, of um, these crimes that are not being caught. Um, I think what is just important, as I also mentioned um, earlier in my presentation, that there really is an importance to continuously monitor um, these kinds of, of, of activity, illegal activity. And the information, you, you can not just rely on, on law enforcers to be able to give you that. You can also rely on, as I mentioned, NGOs, um, um, even uh, communities on the ground, because I'd like to highlight that, you know, um, in, in a lot of provinces in the Philippines, it's the communities themselves that are being used um, by, you know, by big criminal networks as small time poachers or poachers by opportunity, because the, the, the main root of, of why they, they are pushed into, into this kind of criminal activity is because of poverty. And if you don't eliminate this root um, um, this this root of the problem, which is you know um, their economic concerns, you will have more and more um, people in the community that are partaking in this kind of illegal activity. So I think it's also important to approach wildlife crime in that regard that we're not only just looking at you know big networks, but we're also looking at socioeconomic factors that are pushing for these kinds of activities to go on and continue unabated. Thanks, Jessette. I think there's a, a follow-up question on um, safety. Um, you know, as we know, wildlife crimes, uh, you know, is associated with arms dealing, drugs, and so on, and uh, it's it, it can you know pose uh, security uh, risks to journalists who are following these, um, you know, these groups. Um, how do you protect yourself as you go out to investigate wildlife crime? That's a that's a really important question. Um, I always say that the Philippines is such a precarious spot um, because not only is it one of the most dangerous places uh, for journalists, it is also one of the most dangerous places for environmental defenders. And so if you're an environmental journalist, you kind of hit that intersection very cleanly. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's always important to me when I do these kinds of stories that my safety is paramount because I always say that um, you shouldn't pursue stories that will put you in, in grave danger. Um, no story is worth dying for, as some of my more veteran colleagues would say, um, because it is important that you as a journalist is al are alive for you to be able to continue doing the important work that you do. But if you find yourself, for journalists, if you find yourself in precarious situations, in dangerous situations, I think one of the most important um, ways that you can do to protect yourself is to, to assess if, if you know, that story or that legwork is really worth doing, um, assess your risks, and then let other journalists or, of course, your newsroom know what kind of um, stories you're doing so that they would be able to provide you with, with support and if ever, if it's necessary, protection for you to be able to do your stories if it's in a dangerous um, location or in a dangerous area. Thank you, Jisette. Um Yeah, just uh, looking at the time, I think we can do a couple more questions before we move on to the next session. Um, Sadiq, there are a couple of questions for you here. Um, there's a question yeah. from Debbie yeah. and from Kamal. Um, Debbie asked very specifically about um, this uh, case back in 2014 when there's news from Assam. Uh, about a Chinese small arms company, and it's you know, and and she's interested whether you've found any kind of you know, have you have you come across them in your story, um, and, and its relation relationship with uh, uh, rhino horn um, trafficking. Uh, so nothing. 
specific as such, but there's a lot of suggestion that a lot of Chinese arms are making their way to insurgent outfits in the Northeast. But uh, I read Debbie's question uh, just now, and she's uh, mentioning a specific company. So no, so I mean, I haven't come across, uh, and I haven't really looked into it as well in that detail. Maybe that that could make for the next story. You know? Yeah, thanks, but Debbie. There is, there, um, is a lo the, there is a lot of uh, talk of Chinese arms uh, making, you know, making their way to all these the 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 insurgent groups that are active in the northeast. Like, mm -hmm. There are a bunch of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe Debbie can uh, work with uh, um, Sadik and uh, perhaps look into some of these. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, entry points for a story. Um, then this, the question from Kamal, if I understand correctly, is how, how do you kind of raise public awareness and how do we make the public care about rhino horns poaching um, and its impact uh, to the general public? And I think there's a similar question um, down for the, uh, from another um, attendee about, I think, you know, the, the root cause of, of wildlife trade is also um, you know, con con consumers like it like, but there is a demand for for wildlife products, and um, some of these demands are very closely linked to traditions and culture. Um, you know, um, how do we address this issue as we tackle um, the you know this problem of wildlife trade? Um, you know, it, it can be very close to people's heart. You know, in, in terms of the, the the practices and the traditions of of how wildlife is used uh, in the sense of like. Uh, bush meat, consuming of bush meat, and um, some of the traditional Chinese medicine, for example. Um, so yeah, you know, in your experience, how, you know, how do you think uh, journalists can help to to address this and and um, you know get people to care more more about wildlife trade? Um, I'll try to to answer that question, um, if Go I ahead. may. Sure, of I course, just. I think that's a really important question that we should be asking ourselves because when we talk about wildlife crime, in essence, it's not black and white always. There's always these kinds of gray areas that we should be able to also highlight in our reporting. I've, I've come across this issue many times um, because in the Philippines, there are a lot of indigenous groups that you know do consume or even kill um, animals or even um, plants that they use in their cultural beliefs or traditions. And so I, I do think that in our current law, there is an exemption. I do have to double check if in the amendments there still is. But um, it's also important to note that indigenous peoples usually, when they do consume or kill animals, they do not do it in a large scale. They do, they possibly would have to, to consume one or two um, animal or, or plant for a, for them to be able to do, you know, their, to continue doing their cultural traditions. And so maybe that's how we should look at it that way, that we should focus our efforts, uh, our, our government officials should focus their efforts on, on, you know, really focusing on large scale and commercial, um, you know, uh, poaching and trafficking that really endanger uh, animals and their and you know lead to dwindling populations in in a lot of countries, but I'd also like to raise that it's also important that as journalists we also continue educating the public about you know about the status the conservation status of different animals. In one of my interviews, not for this particular story, but for another uh, wildlife um, crime series that I did, um, one of my sources said that when a particular indigenous group in in Central Philippines learned that, for example, this particular bird that they have been using for, for their cultural traditions is already in dwindling numbers, they decided to shift their practices and, and also improvise and, and try to, to, to find ways to continue doing their traditions without harming the environment. So as long as we keep the conversation going, these important conversations going and raise public awareness, I think that... Um, there will be more and more um, opportunities for, for example, these indigenous peoples to, to avoid, um, you know, poaching or or killing wildlife. But then again, as I mentioned, it's not them that we that you know that you know our government officials should be targeting. It is you know the large scale commercial um, poachers, the syndicates that are killing these animals for profit. 
Yeah, that's a really good point, uh, Jusette, you're making. Um, I think a lot of these traditional practices um, and, and, and traditional medicine, it, it comes from a practice that um, that people have you know, in the past when they are trying to make use of the resources in the environment. Um, but it is really this whole commercialization of, of wildlife and, and, and this big scale uh, um, commodification of wildlife that is really driving wildlife trade, but often the tension is is placed on on uh, the more kind of indigenous communities or uh, communities that are you know traditionally using uh, wildlife uh, in their daily lives. Um, Sadik and and Bao Yuan, do you have anything to add before we move on to the next se session? Um, I'm just wary that I think, uh, of the time. Yeah, yeah. I do. I. Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of good examples from the Northeast, for example, uh, how the conservation of Amur falcons who, you know, who visit uh, the states of Manipur, Nagaland, I mean, uh, even Assam and uh, parts of Arunachal Pradesh. So there has been, there has been, uh, after involvement of uh, lo local journalists, local community organizations, civil society groups, they have been able to bring about a considerable change as to how the local population is looking at these birds. That is one success story that would be looked at when you, you know, when you see this. Also, also the also there is an example of uh, hornbill conservation in a in a, in a pocket in Arunachal Pradesh, where earlier a lot of hornbills were hunted, and now the same community has come forward as protector. You know, so all it takes is a uh, is, is is some individual, some uh, you know, local uh, community organizations to come forward, and that could. That, that can change a lot of things. Thank you. Thanks, Sadiq. All right, um, let's move on uh, to the next session. Um, I'm going to hand over to Roxanne, who is going to uh, lead the next session, looking at what data journalists and investigative journalists have in common. Roxanne. Thanks, Amy. And thank you so much, everyone, for that discussion. I think some of the questions uh, that people asked we'll get to in the next Q&A. So please stick around for that. Um, we'll now move on to the second part of our program, which as Amy said, is data. Data is one of the main aspects of Wild Eye, of course. It guides every story that we tell. It shows us when and where to investigate, but often getting good data is difficult. And we've already heard some of the ways journalists, at least these journalists, have managed to overcome and work through this. And we'll hear some more shortly. In this part of the program, we'll hear from data ex experts and reporters who work with data, big, small, from all parts of the world, to tell important and compelling stories. Um, I'm just going to introduce all three of them so that they can take the stage uh, and you don't have to hear from me anymore. First up, we'll hear from Ken Kwang, who is the founder of Data N. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He can correct me if not. Uh, Data N is an organization that trains newsrooms and reporters on how to do data journalism. He is also a Tau Knight Fellow and a competition officer at the Sigma Awards. And Kang is going to answer the question of whether data journalism is an elite beat or is it something that anyone can do. Then we'll hear from Indonesian data journalist Reza Ajay Pratama and Richa Sayal, uh, who reported on wildlife crimes in Malaysia. Their work and presentations are both excellent examples of how to effectively combine investigative and data reporting skills. So just quickly, Reza is the editor of Indonesian publication Haloan.co. Again, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. His investigation for Wild Eye Asia explored Indonesia's new quarantine act how it's, and how it's helping to put a stop to wildlife trafficking. And his presentation today will descri describe how he collected and analyzed court case data um, and then he will hopefully elaborate on the impact of Indonesia's new wildlife laws and the follow-up to his investigation. Um, Richa is a data journalist working with Wild Eye Asia. 
um, and she does incredible things with data. She's also a core member of the Environmental Reporting Collective, who uh, are a regular data source for, for us. Um, as I said, she regularly contributes data to the Wild Eye Asia map. And her investigation combined data collection, analysis, and visualization to show how Malaysia's courts are applying harsher penalties in wildlife cases, um, but are still not reaching the organized syndicate. So her, her work was perhaps more a slightly more um, positive example of how law enforcement is cracking down on wildlife crime. So I'm gonna hand over to King now um and yeah enjoy thank you thank you very much um roxanne for the introduction i'm going to share my screen now all right um i think you all can see my um, slides now um hi everyone uh, my name is quack sir Guang king um i know i have a quite confusing name so you can call me king and uh, Roxanne, you got my uh, company names right, Data N, uh, but not my name, right? Okay. Um, today uh, I only have like five minutes, so I'm trying to you know um, tell uh, share with you you know my views on whether data journalism is an elite bid, right? When we think about elite bid, right, we are talking about you know on the bit that you know um, the top journalists, you know, or those you know journalists from big newsrooms or international newsrooms uh, only can do this kind of uh, reporting, so. I think it really depends on, you know, what kind of data journalism are you thinking about, right? Because we are always exposed to the data journalism done by the Western countries, you know, especially those in the US, as well as Europe, right? So here's a example from the New York Times, right? This is an award-winning report. It's about uh, the air pollution in New Delhi, India. And you definitely need a world-class elite team to do these kind of stories. They actually attach, they use four air pollution uh, devices and one devices that you know, can, can, be, um, can be brought around by the kids, the two kids here. And they are comparing you know, one kid from a rich neighborhood and another kid from a poor neighborhood and how much they are exposed to the polluted air in New Delhi, right? So this kind of you know, data journalism with you know, very smooth and um, <clears throat> sophisticated you know, uh, presentation method um, of course, you know, um, are done by world-class newsrooms like New York Times, Washington Post. Most of them are based in US and Europe, right? And these are the data journalism that we always, you know, talk about and discuss about. And we always think that, oh, there's no way I can produce this kind of reporting. However, <clears throat> I, in my experience of uh, teaching data journalism, giving training to newsrooms for the past um, six years, as well as, you know, as a... Um, um, organizing member of the Sigma Awards, you know, which celebrates the world's best data journalism projects, right? Most of the data journalism actually look like this, okay? This is one that uh, are done by two journalists in Vietnam. They are looking at, you know, the trends of wildlife trafficking in Vietnam during the pandemic, right? So you look at this story, right? Um, they have very little uh, visualization, simple visualization like uh, bar charts, right? Uh, simple maps. And all those um, visualization you can do by using some free tools on the internet, right? So these are the data that we use, right, for this story because I, I also supported these stories uh, on the data um, on, on the data works. So these are the kind of data that you know we we work with, right? Very simple data, you know, not more than you know, um, not no more than one thousand rows of data not more than 20 columns, you know. And these data are also not from the government. These data are collected by the two journalists who are covering the, the, uh, the stories, right? They collected all the data about each um, seizure in Vietnam, you know, and they <clears throat> meticulously uh, recorded all the circumstances around each uh, seizure. You'll see that there's a date, year, uh, how much of uh, the trafficked, you know, um, animals, um, as well as you know the mood of transport and all those things, and these things are not provided by the government. These things are actually collected, you know, by looking at media reports, and but also by you know um, talking to uh, NGOs, right? So these are the projects that we most of uh, the journalists will do, right? So now the answer, you know, is, is very clear: is the uh, data journalism elite bit? I don't think so. Most of their journalism, 
they are not done by you know a, a 20 person team uh, where there's a programmer, there's a designer, there's a web developer, you know, there's even sometimes a data scientist there, right? But no, this is done by two journalists with the help uh, of um, another uh, uh, data journalist, right? So we are dealing with very simple data and visualizations. <clears throat> and the tools of the trade here, right, um, are tools that are not specialized or rocket science. These are tools that everyone can access, right? The basic tools, there are two. One is spreadsheet. Whether you're using a Google Sheets, which is free, or you're using a Microsoft Excel, or you're using Open Office or other kind of you know, spreadsheets programs, right? Most of them are very affordable right now. And visualization apps. And tell you, let me tell you a, a open secret here. Most of the visualization apps, those that are very powerful, they are free and they are online, right? You don't have to install, you don't have to um, have a very powerful uh, computer to run all these programs because they are all online, right? So with the visualization, visualization tools, the apps and the spreadsheets, and with some skills in you know, um, doing spreadsheets, for example, if you have done you know, um, some spreadsheets um, calculation or analysis you know, during your college days, those skills are quite enough, right? And what you need next is actually one, some kind of uh, some basic introduction to data journalism. What are the best practices, right? And I think you will be able to produce simple data journalism stories, right? And at the end of the day, it is not about whether you know, your projects looks very beautiful, creative, you know, and very sleek, right? At the end of the day, it is about impact, okay? And this is what I want to emphasize, right? Impact is the most important, um, I think, measure of, of, uh, of any journalistic reports. And no matter you know, what kind of uh, presentation or how um, sophisticated your visualization is, right? But if there is no impact, right? And you know, those are not, you know, we, we don't call them um, very good data journalism projects, right? Um, based on our criteria at the Sigma Awards, we um, just we, we usually pick the, the winners. One of the most important criteria is the impact of that story. And this is what I would like to share with you today. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Kang. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you for shedding light on uh, the mysterious beast that is data journalism. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Reza. Reza, are you there? Um, yes, hi Roxanne. Hi, I, I will share my screen with your presentation. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Roxanne. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Reza. Uh, I'll, I'm here in this opportunity. I want to share my latest story with the Oxpeaker, uh, which launched in September uh, last year. So, um, next, please. Uh, before we are going too far, I want to give you some backgrounds of the story. Um, so basically, if we talk about the criminal uh, wildlife crime in Indonesia, so, so we will talk about the Conservation Act, which uh, promulgated in 1990, which is very outdated law, and the prosecutor still using the act. So in the, it's failed to give a different effect to the criminal because the verdict is the still lenient. And, but however, I've uh, found this new hope because uh, yeah, I think in the last of 2019, the uh, House of Representatives uh, launched the new law, the new, uh, the new law, which um, it actually the different law with the conservation because it's uh, focused on quarantine law. Uh, as a substitute of the similar act with promulgated in 1992. So this new law stipulated higher predicts up to 10 years compared to the Conservation Act, uh, which only uh, stipulated on up to four years and fine up to uh, around six, 690,000 US dollars. So it's huge. Uh, punishment for the criminal and 
uh, this new law was quickly adopted by the prosecutors and there is a case in uh, in Pekanbaru uh, in Riau province in uh, June of 2020 where the prosecute the, the the prosecutor used the new quarantine act to um, to sue the criminal uh, the syndicate which operating between Malaysia and Indonesia and they was given uh, four years in jail and fine up to six and eight thousand six and six eighteen thousand dollars which is which was the highest ever of wildlife crime project in the country oh um next please so this this all this all track uh bring me to question about the average of wildlife projects i want to know the efforts of wildlife verdicts and as well as the impact how the new quarantine act will impact the uh, wildlife crime in the country and the future of eradicating wildlife crime itself so and of, of course the how essential to revise the conservation act uh, which very outdated so next please Okay, to answer this question, I have to go to uh, I have to go to my own data source. I decided to go to Code Verdicts, which luckily available uh, at the Supreme Court website. So I have to basically I I did the simple way by extracting the information on the website and transforming it into database. Uh, actually, I was inspired by how the wildlife project categorize each of the database. So I think today it will be easier for journalists to access the code for this data since the wildlife already compiling them into a specific database. However, when I did the story last year, the, the wildlife database is still in progress. So I have to do it by myself. So that's all my, so I also uh, made a contact with the NGOs and the, the other organization and etc and research uh, next please well i think uh although it was the idea is pretty simple you have you just have to extract the information and but it's a long process because uh, the Supreme Court website it's only available in Indonesian language and it's not very user friendly um, I have to input the keyword um, in choosing the wildlife related case and then I have to downloading the court document in the PDF format and then uh, which contain a dozen of pages and I have to and the final step I have to extract the essential information into spreadsheet um, it's it's I think it's for multiple multiple steps I have to done and I have to repeat it for other dozens of cases. So actually, uh, there are hundreds of cases in in the website, but uh, only, but it's uh, difficult to extract all of the data because uh, limited of human resources and strict deadline. But I think when I think it's enough to give me a better perspective of wildlife in Indonesia, uh, so basically I made a spreadsheet like what can show uh, in the previous presentation. So uh, next, please. Okay, this uh, Roxen, can you play the video here? Uh, the top of the yes. No. Uh, okay. This video. This uh, the top and on, on the top. Uh, left of the presentation here is the website of the Supreme Court. Um, I want to show you uh, the step of here. Uh, can you play the video, Roxanne? Okay. If, uh, Sorry, I, think... I don't think it's working. Sorry. Ah, okay. Okay. We we can we can uh, we can go back later. So uh, next, please. Okay, 
uh, like what King said, what is uh, the most important thing is the impact. So what is the impact of the story? So not long after the Pekanbaru Code used the Quarantine Act to punish the perpetrators, it's the other uh, prosecutor quickly adopted this new law. Uh, for example, uh, this year in uh, Tanjung Karang Court in Lampung Province used the same act to give a uh, to punish the bird smuggler and, and the other the other court also do the same thing, but I think it's still a long way to uh, to we have we still have to wait what is the impact of the new law and this new law in, in, in fight against the wild wildlife crime in Indonesia. I think uh, but the other the other thing the other impact uh, is I think the other journalists can, uh, in the, can in, especially in Indonesia, can do the same thing, uh, the same method to utilize the court verdicts for different criminal cases or the corruption case, for instance. And because, because like, uh, I agree, I very agree with uh, Kang because uh, uh, data journalism it's not about all all about um, fancy visualization, but it's. Uh, it can begin with a very simple way uh, to uh, building your own database and transfer it into spreadsheet. In this report, I also I only use the uh, spreadsheet and the other visualization for free, uh, free visualization apps, such as um, yeah, a lot of things, a lot of them available for the for free. So um, this also adding more pressure, uh, this, this story adding more pressure to the government to uh, continue to revise the uh, Conservation Act, which very outdated because uh, the Conservation Act actually has been revised for uh, many, many times, but it, the process was always hampered. Uh, so we still wait for the revise and for the suitable bills uh, to be updated again. I think uh, that's all for me. Thank you for your time. Great, thanks. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Richa and then we'll move into a Q&A. Thanks, Rosa. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for sticking through to the last presentation. I'm going to share my screen and present. Hopefully you all can hear me well and you can see my screen. So um, just to reiterate, my name is Richa Sayal. I'm a freelance journalist that focuses on wildlife and marine crime. I also use data and web development to support other journalists in their own reporting. I was based in Malaysia up until the COVID-19 pandemic and I have since relocated to the UAE. So to begin, there's many methods that I use to combine data skills with investigative reporting, but for the purposes of this presentation, I will talk about my own Wild Eye Asia piece, which uses court data to uncover new trends in Malaysian wildlife convictions. So to begin, the main question that I really wanted to know was whether Malaysian courts were issuing heavier penalties for wildlife crime. For those who don't know, Malaysia follows three separate legislations for wildlife protection. In Peninsular Malaysia, there's the Wildlife Conservation Act. In Sabah, there's the Wildlife Conservation Enactment. And in Sarawak, there's the Wildlife Protection Ordinance. This is important because all three legislations follow varying maximum penalties for protected and totally protected species. So to begin, I use three types of data collection. Number one, obviously court data. I narrowed down relevant sections across all three legislations uh, in my search for court data. And then I used media reports by setting up Google alerts for keywords, both in Malay and in English, for any sort of recent convictions that were reported on. I also sifted through years of past media reports and compiled into a spreadsheet um, any sort of conviction data that I could find. And then I also collaborated with local NGOs. One in particular was Justice for Wildlife Malaysia. They happened to be collecting similar data to me at that time. And so we shared in our resources and that really helped fill in some of the gaps in the data that I had. 
So like many of the other journalists we heard today, there were plenty of barriers and challenges with finding the data. Number one, official court data is extremely scarce, especially for ongoing cases. So that was probably the biggest challenge. Um, there's also a lack of public access to this data. I personally had to get a lawyer to give me access to a centralized database. And even still, the, the level of updated and archived court cases were quite minimal. And although this information is not confidential, there is still a general hesitation by prosecutors to share any sort of information or updates on cases. I would say overall case tracking is extremely tedious. It takes time and a lot of resources. So with the data that I was, met, that I was able to compile, there were three interesting insights that I want to point out. Within the court reports and the sentencing decisions that I was reading, I saw a common reference to a 2014 case in which an appeals court judge increased the penalty that was originally uh, sentenced in the Sessions Court. In the Sessions court. Um, this was in relation to the possession of five water monitor lizards at the Kuala Lumpur airport. And I noticed that of the sentencing decisions that came after, those that directly referenced the 2014 case either issued a stricter penalty at the outset, or they also increased their own penalty from the Sessions Court if it was at the appeals level. So I spoke to experts about this and they kind of verified that this 2014 case was a bit of a landmark case in terms of wildlife convictions in Malaysia. This points to the second case, that, the second point that I want to make, which is there generally seems to be a higher judge awareness on the severity of wildlife crime. One example that I read was a judge in Suramban when she was uh, making her decision in, in relation to an offender who had the possession of a immature white-handed gibbon actually pointed out in her sentencing decision that poachers often shoot the mothers of white-handed gibbons in order to lure the baby to the ground for capture. Uh, this particular judge sentenced the offender to three years in jail with a fine of 20,000 ringgit. And there were more than one uh, occasions where I read sentencing decisions that actually pointed to actively wanting to stop Malaysia as being seen as a hotspot for global wildlife crime. But the main point was that there was a significant increase in fines. And of course, I point you to the piece that I did to see more concrete examples of this, but just a snapshot I included below, a November 2015 case, the possession of one clouded leopard resulted in the fine of 50,000 ringgit. Four years later, the possession of one clouded leopard under the same charge, under the same legislation, resulted in the fine of 100,000 ringgit plus two years in jail. Obviously, there are several exogenous factors that judges take into consideration when giving out a penalty. And this, these two cases are not, are not directly comparable, but is, it, it's a general snapshot of how things have changed over time. So overall, what are some lessons on using data to enhance your investigative reporting that I can share from this experience? Number one, I would say look for common denominators the beauty of having clean and validated data is that you're able to see factors that have stayed the same over a certain period of time. Um, identify any sort of quantitative change, any sort of rates of increase or decrease to give your readers a sense of scale and verify with experts any sort of trends that you're beginning to recognize in your data. They'll be able to tell you if this is actually what they're noticing on the ground and humanize the numbers as much as possible by adding voices, stories, names to the numbers you're trying to represent. And I would argue the last two are quite important. Uh, the first is to be transparent on both the gaps in the story and in the data. I want to emphasize the data here. I think it's very important for readers to know what's missing in the data, why it's missing, and how they should be interpreting the data. And lastly, please support further reporting on this topic in this region by keeping your data open source. This is a personal plea to NGOs, other newsrooms, other journalists that are compiling similar data sets. As we've heard today, it's very difficult to get access to reliable data um, on wildlife trafficking or wildlife trade in general. So 
moving forward, it would be a great help if we could get more access to this through other third party initiatives. And uh, this is the link to the article. This is my email. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And uh, Roxanne, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Rosa and Rachel. Um, I think it's fantastic to hear about such pragmatic and successful collaboration. Um, and as I said, sorry. Um, and as I said previously, um, how to combine those investigative um, and data skills to produce such good and important and compelling storytelling. So thank you both. Uh, I'm now going to hand over back over to Amy for a quick Q&A uh, before we close off the session. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, for your questions and your patience. And uh, just to say quickly before I hand over to Amy, if we don't answer your questions here, please do reach out to us on social media um, and via the Wild Eye Asia tool. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, yeah, it's not very common um, to have so many uh, journalists across Asia to be sharing their, their experience doing uh, a wildlife um, story. So it's a really um, great opportunity that we have today. So thank you all to all the panelists. Uh, we're just going to uh, look at some uh, questions that we still haven't answered. Um, I think the question from Han, uh, Has Has Hasata, Hasata um, it's really interesting about uh, confidentiality, like, you know, when you get details and information uh, from your sources, do you do you share that? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you share that with um, law enforcement authorities um, in order to take action? Um, to what extent do you, uh, you know, if you are in, if you get a source from an illegal wildlife trade uh, uh, kingpin or from one of the the members, um, how would you um, how would you uh, how would you deal with that information? Do you share with um, you know, the, the law enforcement uh, authorities? Um, anybody would like to take this question? Richard, do you have any experience in this area where you get some, or is it Sadiq who would like to take oh, this sure. question? I can... I can give a quick stab at this. So when I was based in Malaysia, I worked for RAGE, which is an investigative newsroom. And one of the big projects that they did was to look into all of the key components within pangolin trafficking. And what some of the journalists uncovered was there was a lot of illegal activity that was being um, supported by some enforcement. And what ended up happening was as all good journalists should do, they just confronted the enforcement for a response. They said, here's the evidence that we have, the first-hand accounts that we have, and we just require a response. So that was one way to go about this. Uh, but for the purposes of this story, I did not go up to enforcement and ask them for any sort of clarification on certain cases. What I did instead, because this was focused mainly on court data, was to go up to local NGOs that are actively working in the space and share in that data with them so that together you have a more robust data set um, of some of the key trends that are happening in terms of wildlife trade, so. Thank you, Richard. Any other panelists have this experience of maybe getting some, some sensitive data and, and, and whether or not you, you share with the law enforcement authorities or whether you think, you know, the journalists um, should be sharing such information and data. I, I think, think what is, one, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think what we should be doing is we should be writing about it as, you know, as and when we get this sensitive information. So, I mean, if you write about it, then uh, law enforcement will anyway, you know, have access to that story and then they can take it forward from there, you know. Yeah. That's a, I think that's a good approach, um, you know, um, 
yeah, I think for for journalists, I think there there is still that um, uh, that that journalism ethics there in terms of uh, protecting your your sources. Um, any there's a and there's another question on financial institutions. Uh, whether I think a lot of you have used court data, media reports, and uh, data from NGOs for your stories. Do you think you can get data from financial institutions as well? And have you have you had that experience working with financial institutions? Anyone? Yeah, I think um, I think I will answer the question. Okay, I mean, I think. Sure, um, Reza. Go ahead. Yeah, I think in my opinion, financial institution uh, they have a very huge impact and to the wildlife trafficking network also because some of the uh, banking institution, for example, they they are committed to uh, run the green banking and uh, not to uh, not to support the wildlife traffic network. So I think I think this can be a um, different way and different angle for the journalists to um, to go through the financial institution because uh, it's sometimes it's it's uh, the wildlife trafficking, it's all about uh, uh, the involved the uh, huge organization, uh, huge syndicate, which operating between uh, two or more or three or con more countries. So I think it's it can be one way or the other to uh, access the financial institutions. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I think journalists can also uh, report on, um, you know, obligations of, of of financial institutions and whether they they them, you know whether there needs to be more uh, regulations around, um, you know, the the, the investments uh, they can provide, um, you know, and and more monitoring of of these in, in investments and and loans um, to illegal um, groups. Would anybody like to add to that? I think there's another question on whether you think there's a need for a better kind of multilateral agreement um, that's transboundary. Um, for example, it could be across uh, Southeast Asia uh, region, maybe through ASEAN or another network, uh, an another association uh, in the Asia region, so that um, you know there's a more kind of it's easier for, for agencies uh, to monitor wildlife crime and other environmental crimes uh, in the region that, that, you know, that involve transboundary um, movements. I think in, in I'll take this one. Uh, I think in India, the, the agency which is there already, the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, I think it, first it needs to be more proactive than what it is right now, because uh, you know their data set is not complete. They're supposed to have data from uh, all states that is not happening. The states are not uh, properly collaborating with them. So there are a lot of problems already, which first need to be sort, sorted out before these guys can, uh, you know, before we could move to the next step of collaborating with other, uh, you know, other agencies in the neighborhood. That collaboration needs to be need, I mean, needs to be firmed up. But there is also what I find is there is also a lack of interest. Like for example, all, all these like all the crime uh, investigation agencies are more interest are less interested in wildlife crimes. They they tend to ignore them, even though a lot of them have transnational linkages. So they but they are not in the focus at all. So I think there is a lot that needs to be done there. Yeah, thanks, Sadiq. Um, I guess with with COVID nineteen, um, you know, there is there seems to be a, a more more attention now going to wildlife trade, and I and I hope you know this gives uh, some impetus for uh, you know government agencies um, to work closer together, and also for the media um, to report more on wildlife uh, crime. Um, Jasette, you have your hand up. Would you like to say something? Yeah, thanks, Amy. I just wanted to add um, a quick response to that question with regards to like a regional collaboration. 
I'm not sure if, if the participants are aware, but there's actually something called the ASEAN WEN or the ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network. So this is actually kind of an old network. It has been established in 2005, if I'm not mistaken, and it's based in Bangkok. Um, but I do agree also with what Sadiq has said that there needs to be more proactive measures to be done um, in terms of um, addressing wildlife crime from a transboundary perspective. Um, I'm speaking from experience um, in the Philippines that it's a, it serves three roles in the wildlife trade. It's not just a source or a destination, but it's also a, a transshipment point. Um, so we do have lots of um, wildlife coming in from, for example, from Indonesia, from Australia, from Papua New Guinea to be shipped to countries such as um, the United States or, or in Europe or even in Japan or China. And so it's, it's important that we do have, you know, these kinds of cross-country measures to be able to not just track the criminals, but also the financial flows. Uh, because we cannot expect to, you know, our governments cannot really expect to, to, to really crack down on wildlife crime without following the money as well. And I think for journalists, that's also a challenge um, in terms of covering um, um, wildlife trade and trafficking, really just following that, that trail of where the money flows. Um, that's why I think also in the Philippines, they're trying to strengthen um, you know, um, the, the anti-money laundering law in, for it to also cover wildlife trafficking. And so that's also something to, to look forward to in terms of how the, the, my government in the Philippines at least um, uh, addresses wildlife crime. Thank you, Jacette. Um, so yeah, I think this uh, bring us um, you know, close to the end of this um, discussion. Uh, it's been a really rich and interesting discussion so far. Um, I think we've heard about a lot of common barriers to doing um, stories uh, using data uh, to, to monitor wildlife uh, crimes, uh, including uh, the difficulty in accessing data, like a lot of data is not uh, you know, totally uh, open to the public. Um, but I think uh, listening to all of you, you've used different ways to overcome this, this challenge. Uh, by looking at a range of data sources, you know, not just court cases, but also through media reports, um, through NGOs, and through your own contacts that have been built um, over the years, and also working with other experts like lawyers um, and so on. Um, so thank you all. And um, I think it's, it's useful to also note that, um, you know, the importance of, of bringing a human interest to these stories, um, you know, following these data over time and looking at some of the common factors and trends and then verifying that with, with experts. Um, and and I, I think lastly, the most important thing that I've been hearing from you is the importance of sharing, uh, sharing the information you have, uh, making data, making the data you collected uh, open source, um, you know, and, and sharing with, with a platform like Wild Eye Asia. That, that helps to present these data in a very accessible way and, and continuing to track uh, data and to help researchers and journalists um, develop more stories um, and to collaborate uh, across borders. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's, that's uh, the key takeaways that uh, I've got from today. And I hope um, our participants um, have also uh, been uh, taking some of these uh, tips and notes. Um, just one, uh, one news to share. Um, the Wild Eye Asia and uh, the story that they have worked together with uh, Reza and Wan in Indonesia. Uh, both of these uh, projects have, have been shortlisted. They're in the finalists of the Sigma Awards, which I think King introduced. Uh, it's, it's, it's the award, it's a very prestigious award that uh, celebrates the best data journalism uh, across the world. So congratulations and, and, and good luck um, with, uh, with this award. Um, and finally, um, the EJN, the Earth Journalism Network, uh, has recently launched a zoonotic disease um, reporting course uh, for journalists. This is an online course that's totally free. Um, it provides a very good introduction um, to, to zoonotic diseases and how journalists can, can cover this increasingly important uh, topic. So uh, please check out uh, the, this course. I think um, the link is on our website and I think uh, my colleague will be sharing the link here on the chat. Um, I think that's all uh, we have today. It's been uh, a great pleasure to spend uh, the last almost an, an hour and a half, close to two hours with, with all of you. 
um, thank you so much to all the panelists and to uh, Roxanne and uh, Fiona at the Oxpackers for this great work that you've done uh, with uh, Walleye Asia. And I hope um, we can continue to work on stories and sharing data um, you know, to deepen our understanding in wildlife uh, crime. Thank you all. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Todd. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.